In a delightful twist of irony, Joy Reid, the esteemed political commentator, has taken a gleeful jab at the GOP's theatrical antics following President Biden's State of the Union address, branding them as nothing short of silly and performative. One can almost hear the circus music playing in the background as Reid expertly dissects the absurdities on her show, serving up a delectable platter of political satire for her audience's amusement. Senator Katie Britt's feeble attempt at a rebuttal to Biden's address hasn't just fallen flat, it's crashed and burned in spectacular fashion, earning her the dubious honor of being universally panned, even by her own Republican colleagues. It's a performance so cringeworthy that even the most seasoned political observers can't help but squirm in their seats, wondering if this is the best the GOP has to offer in response to the current administration. And then there's the much-talked-about Trump playdate with Victor, a rendezvous between the former president and Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban at the exclusive Mar-a-Lago resort. The mere thought of these two titans of authoritarianism sharing pleasantries over tea sends shivers down the spine of democracy-loving folks everywhere. President Biden, ever the vigilant guardian of democratic principles, wasted no time in expressing his disdain for such cozy rendezvous, rightly calling out the dangers lurking beneath the surface. But fret not, dear viewer, for Joy Reid's incisive commentary serves as a beacon of sanity in this sea of political absurdity. With her razor-sharp wit and keen insight, she navigates through the murky waters of contemporary politics, shining a light on the hypocrisies and follies of the MAGA GOP. Of course, it's always wise to consult multiple sources and perspectives when dissecting the political landscape. But for those seeking a healthy dose of satire served with a side of truth, Joy Reid's analysis is the perfect remedy. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the spectacle. After all, in the circus of American politics, every act is more absurd than the last. But we begin tonight with the gloves off version of President Joe Biden, who used his State of the Union address to stand up for freedom and democracy at home and abroad. In what was likely his most important speech as he runs for re-election, Biden was forceful and coherent, opening with a riff on the U.S. standing up to Hitler in the 1940s and Ronald Reagan facing down the USSR, and then putting a primetime spotlight on reproductive rights including calling out the Supreme Court to their faces for ending the federal right to abortion. Biden issued a wake-up call on the threats to democracy we're facing, ripping the Republican Party over January 6th, while using frequent ad-libs to draw battle lines with Donald Trump, whom he referred to 13 times during the speech as my predecessor. I see a future where defending democracy, you don't diminish it. I see a future will restore the right to choose and protect our freedoms, not take them away. I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. My lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, a future based on core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, dignity, equality, to respect everyone to give everyone a fair shot, to give hate no safe harbor. Now, other people my age see it differently. And I will always be president for all Americans, because I believe in America. The president energized Dems in the chamber, amped them up, really, so much so that the Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock of Ebenezer Baptist Church complimented Biden afterward for preaching. Listen, I'm a preacher. I know a sermon when I hear one and I heard one tonight. It's helpful to remember that Biden, who was a senator for decades, was on his home turf. He enjoyed himself so much. He stayed until the lights went out, literally taking his time exiting the House chamber as he caught up with lawmakers and chatted about policy. He also got a standing ovation and fist bump from United Auto Workers President Sean Fain who is emerging as a top surrogate for Biden's re-election bid in Michigan. It was quite a split, split screen with the assembled Republicans, who were, for the most part, silly, obnoxious, and performative. Like Troy Nels, who wore, without irony, a shirt with Trump's mugshot printed on it, along with the words, never surrender, even though the photo is of Trump literally surrendering. As for Marjorie Taylor Greene, let's just say you can't elect your way to class or dignity. She put herself in violation of House rules by donning a Trump campaign hat from his past failed election bid. The contrasts with the other side couldn't be clearer, but the most damning split screen of all 
wasn't the MAGA clowns who were there, but rather the ringmaster in Florida, who spent the night fuming over Biden's success by using Snapchat filters to turn Biden into a Pinocchio and a dog, as if he's a petulant middle schooler with a phone and not enough homework. But the tomfoolery aside, the truly terrifying contrast has to do with what Trump reportedly did today, which was to meet with Viktor Orban, Hungary's autocratic prime minister. The dictator playdate was to occur at Mar-a-Lago, home of Trump and quite possibly our national secrets. Orban champions what he calls illiberal democracy. After losing his bid for re-election in 2002, he plotted a comeback that would ensure he never lost again. When he was elected again in 2010, he got to work quickly. He has cracked down on the media and the judiciary in his country. His loyalists rewrote the Hungarian constitution and changed hundreds of laws to keep Orban and his party in power and to render elections no more than a formality. Trump has an affinity for men like Orban and Putin and Kim Jong-un for the obvious reasons. It's an infatuation he happens to share with the American right. Is Hungary a model for Trump? Of course it is. And so away we go. After cowing nearly every elected Republican, as of today, Trump has now officially taken over the Republican National Committee. With the installation of loyalist Michael Watley, the former head of the North Carolina Republican Party, and Lara Trump, Donald Trump's daughter-in-law. Watley is a proud election denier, while Lara claims that Republican voters want the RNC to pay her father-in-law's massive legal bills. And she could be right. After all, it's a cult. It's also a Viktor Orban-style playbook, seizing control of first a major political party and then any institution that stands in his way. We are now in a political reality where the age and experience of people like Joe Biden are viewed as a political liability, while cult-like fandom matters more. Have a listen for a moment to Beth Block, the RNC member who officially nominated Lara Trump this morning, as she invokes nothing less than God Almighty in making her nomination of her new and unqualified leader. In a world where qualifications are often measured by titles and years of experience, we are reminded of a powerful truth. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Laura Trump is the embodiment of this truth. Joining me now is Tom Nichols, staff writer for The Atlantic and NBC News presidential historian Michael Beschloss, both friends of the show. Thank you both for being here. Tom, I want to start with you first because you talk a lot about this. It, it, there's a combination of it being frightening and just deeply unserious. Uh, last night, I thought that Republicans put on a show that would have been embarrassing if middle schoolers did it. Um, it wasn't dignified. It wasn't adult. It was silly. But at the same time, it did also show that they truly have drunk the authoritarian Kool-Aid. They're all autocrats enablers and sycophants, and they wanted it to be displayed. 